Awesome. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So thanks so much for letting me know where you are coming from and uh, how much studies have you already done. I see that most of you are just starting, but also there are quite a few people who've been studying a while. So I will want to make sure that you get the most out of this workshop. And I'll, I'll share with you in a moment how exactly we're going to do this. And also, we are going to interact tonight or this morning for you through a poll and through a chat box. So that's how we're going to do this. Just because of the number of people in this class in our normal and our regular GMAT mastery course, uh, you're going to be in a much smaller class. So you'll be able to unmute yourself and be on the video. But here tonight, uh, this is just how we're going to do this. So yes, we will share the recording with you tomorrow. You're going to get a link. Of course, the recording isn't ready yet, but we will share it, don't worry. And if you have a question that can wait, then you just wish that we answer at some point throughout this workshop, just please put it in the Q&A box, okay? But we'll interact through the chat box and through the poll. So I'm gonna end the poll right now and we'll bring it back when we do more cool things. But I wanted to, again, like I mentioned, mention that I want you to get the most out of this class. And the way to do this is really to participate. Now, you could just sit here passively and simply just watch me show you things. And then at the end of the class, you might say, wow, this was really interesting. And, you know, Sergey is really cool. And uh, I like his shirt. And, you know, he knows how to do the questions. But I really want you to learn how to do the questions. And the way to do this is get a little outside of your comfort zone. So I'm going to give you some exercises to do. We're going to do a few questions tonight and I'm going to share with you lots of different strategies as much as we can possibly do in these two hours. And I want you to just do them, right? Don't just sit there, watch me do them, actually do them yourself. I'm going to give you some time as we go through these exercises. So the first exercise is going to be just to warm us up. It's going to be fairly simple for most of you. Uh, and it's a, it's a fairly typical problem solving question on the GMAT. So here you go. I am going to give you literally just 30 seconds. And I'm going to ask you to share your answers here in a poll. All right, five more seconds, choose an answer if you haven't already, and we will talk about this question right now. Okay, let me stop the poll. Let me actually share the results with you. So as you could see, uh, most people chose C, few people chose B and D and E. Let's discover what is the right answer. And I just want to give you just a little forewarning that the way I play in my classes is we don't have such thing as the right answer. We have, or the, rather the wrong answer. We have the right answer and we have an answer from which we can learn. So if you get this question right, congratulations, that's amazing. If you got this question wrong, congratulations, that's amazing because now you can learn something. That this is really important, right? That's why we're here. The only time when it really matters whether you get the question right is on the real test. And even then, there'll be questions that you get wrong. And I'll explain why in a moment. So let's discover what is the correct answer to this question. Drum roll, please. And that is C. So C is the correct answer now. How did we actually do this? How did we figure out that this is the right answer? What exactly did we need to know here? Well, a couple of things. Firstly, we needed to know uh, what's an exponent, right? I mean, what in the world is, is the exponent? Well, if we take three to the power of three, that is simply three times three times three. And that, by the way, is 27. And if we take one to the power of one, uh, that's just one, and two to the power of two, that was four, and three to the power of three was 27. So if we add one, four, and 27, we will end up with a number 32. 
Now, if you notice on the previous page, we didn't actually have 32 among the answer choices. We had powers of two. So we also needed to know, or we needed to calculate that two to the power of five is 32. Now we could just simply know it just because we've learned our powers of two. That's really helpful. We'll save us some time on the test. But if we didn't memorize it, then we can just multiply two onto itself until we get to 32. And we'll count that there are actually five twos that we needed to multiply onto themselves. So that is why the answer was actually two to the power of five, C. Now we needed to understand what's an exponent. We also needed to know how to multiply and divide. Now this was a little bit of a warm up. Now, if you got this right, don't worry, we're going to have more, more challenging questions coming up. If you got this uh, wrong, then again, don't worry. You've just learned something and we'll get to practice more of what we've just learned. Now, you might be wondering, well, okay, well, this is basic math, right? I mean, this is what I've learned in like grade four or maybe even grade one for some of you. So does the GMAT math get a lot more complicated? You know, I've heard that the math on the GMAT is difficult, but what you are just showing me, Sergey, is, is simple stuff. So let me go and quote people who make the test right now, just to put things in perspective for you. And that is, according to the GMAT, the Graduate Management Admission Council, people who make the test, you need to know for the GMAT not more than what is generally taught in secondary school classes. Now, by generally, they mean, well, look, you might have gone to a school in the United States or in Canada or maybe in Brazil or in Russia. So we're going to take something that's taught everywhere, which means we can't really take everything because in some countries we learn stuff that we don't in other countries. And what we'll actually take is some arithmetic, so basically a science of numbers, how the numbers work. Uh, we'll take some elementary algebra some really basic stuff, just like what you've seen now. This is actually algebra, even though algebra is usually variables, but exponents are actually a part of algebra. And we also need to know some very commonly known geometry concepts, like what's a triangle, you know, what's an area of a triangle, what's a circle, things like that. So not too complicated. And you might be wondering, well, wait a second, why is the GMAT difficult then if the mass is not that complicated? Well, don't worry, we'll discover this in a moment and I'll show you exactly why. And perhaps we should jump into it right now. Let me show you another question. That, by the way, is going to look almost exactly like the question we've just done. So if uh, you've got this basic concept, then let me show you another question. You will just have different numbers. That's all. Everything else is going to be the same. And then I will ask you, and even the answer choices are not going to have power. So it will be a little bit simpler. So here you go. Here's another question. The only thing I'm going to ask you, and this is really important, please bear with me. Please do not use calculators or Google that counts as a calculator as well. On the GMAT, you are not allowed to use a calculator. The only thing you can use is pen and paper. That's it. So you have about a minute and pen and paper to try to find the right answer. Here you go.
All right. It's been a minute. I'll give you another 15 seconds or so to choose the answer, whichever answer you think is right. Doesn't really matter. Honestly, we've agreed that there are no right and wrong answers. The answers we can learn from. So whichever one works best. Give you five more seconds. All right, let me end the poll. Let me share the results with you. So as you could see, quite a, a lot of variety of answer choices here. E was the most popular answer and then C and D were equal, but a much smaller percentage of people. And then we had people for B and A and, uh, and not everybody answered. So only 75% uh, of people here on this call actually chose the answer. Uh, so it looks a little more challenging, right? Can, you, can somebody tell me in the chat box, what was more challenging about this question? Just throw it in the chat box and I'll, I'll see what you're typing. And then I'll show you different ways of looking at this question. Okay, yeah, a few people are saying, well, larger numbers to work with. So one to the power of one was easy, but how about 14 to the power of four? That, so that's a big number. And notice how I've given you a minute, 30 seconds. So I haven't, I haven't given you a lot. Yes, yeah, somebody was saying the amount of multiplication and plus all of these large numbers and you know, 16 to the power of six gets fairly large. Now we're dealing with all of these millions. Um, by the way, if you can use a chat box, that'd be great. Uh, the the Q&A box is really good if you want to ask a question that I can get to at some point. So that would be great. Um, but the Q&A box, I might not see right away. So the chat box is really good. Well, thanks so much. Everybody's saying larger numbers. So let me show you a couple of different ways of doing this question. This is how most people are going to look at this question. Let's call it the theory way or the high school way. And we call it some other ways as well throughout this class tonight. Now, what I can do is now I know what's an exponent. I know how to multiply and I know how to add. So I can simply calculate 14 to the 4, 15 to the 5, 16 to the 6. And I can add the, line up these numbers, add them all up, and I will get an answer. And by the way, the answer is D. So if you did get a D and you didn't use a calculator, congratulations. But I can only imagine that you probably did not do this because this strategy is going to take probably like eight minutes. And I have not given you anywhere close to eight minutes. So the way we did things in a high school, and especially in a high school, we had to actually show all the workings, explain exactly how we did it step by step. Otherwise, even if we get the right answer, we might still get a bad mark, right? You remember? That's what usually happens in a high school. But here, this is a multiple choice exam. So I need to choose the answer. So how am I going to choose the answer? Now, by the way, Notice how I didn't say I need to solve a problem. And we'll come back to this. Solving a problem and choosing the answer is not the same thing. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll say, OK, I know for sure that the GMAT is not about being a human calculator. This is a test to get into a business school. So maybe. I'm gonna use some strategies. Maybe I'll do something else. And one of the strategies that I could use is what called, what's called the units digit strategy. So here's how this strategy works. If I need to multiply or add numbers, any numbers, it, this also works for subtraction, by the way, just have to be a little careful with subtraction, but with addition multiplication, it works really easily. So if I were to have these two numbers and if I want to multiply them, where do I start? Do I start with multiplying one by two or do I start by multiplying six by seven? Let me know in the chat box. What do you think? What's the first step? One by two or six by seven? <laughs> yeah, six by seven. A few people are saying, well, of course, we start at the end. And six by seven, by the way, is 42. Right, that's, we all remember our tens multiplication table. So what's going to happen next? Once we multiply six by seven, we get a 42. And then usually we take the four, we carry it over to the next digit. And then the two stays where it is. And we just keep going, keep going, keep going until we're done. 
which probably will take us like 10 minutes or two minutes if we know what we're doing. But what's interesting is that last digit that is called the units digit is going to stay as two. Nothing's going to change it. So what if this were part of a multiple choice exam? Maybe all I need to do is look at my answer choices and say, which one ends in a two? And I'll just choose it and move on. So here in this question, you will see that most of the answer choices have different units digits. We have a couple with a five, but the other ones have one, five, six, and seven. So this is, these are pretty good bets. And even the one with a five, one of them is 4 million, another one is 184 million. So even if I do end up with a five, I can probably figure whether it's like 4 million or 200 million almost. So let me go ahead and choose or find the units digit of this whole expression, find just the last digit, and I have nothing but multiplication and addition, so I can actually do this. So let's, let's start. And you actually realize in a moment that this will be easier than we think right now. So what's 14 to the power of four? Well, let's take it one step at a time. 14 to the power of one is 14. Yeah, that, we all know that, right? That, that's simple. Well, how about 14 squared? You might have learned that 14 squared is 196. If you did, amazing. If you didn't, that's okay. Because remember what we just learned? Four times four, that's 16. I got two digits at the end, two units digits, four times four, I got 16. The one gets carried over, the six stays where it is. That's it, so 14 squared ends in a six. That's all I need to understand right now. Don't do more work than you need to. So let's keep going. I need to go to 14 to the power of three. So that is just 14 squared multiplied again by 14. So I already have a number that ends in a six. And now I'm gonna take another number that ends in a four, which is 14. So what's six times four? That's 24. So now I know 14 cubed ends in a four, right? right. You with me so far? All right, now we need to get to 14 to the power of four. So all we need to do is just take 14 cubed multiplied by 14 again, four times four, that's again 16. So what we've just learned is that 14 to the power of four ends in a six. Now, by the way, I'm sure you're starting to notice something. It looks like there's a pattern. And if I were to ask you, what's 14 to the power of a thousand? Can anybody tell me 14 to the, just put it in the chat box, 14 to the power of 1000, what will be the units digit? Yeah, exactly. Most people are saying that is going to be six because we can notice a pattern. Whenever I had the odd power, I ended up with a four. Whenever I had the even power, I ended up with a six. So 14 to the thousand, thousand is an even number. So I'll end up with a six. All right. Now, can anybody tell me in the chat box? I love the participation. Thanks so much. What's 15 to the power of five going to end in? Yeah, somebody's like five, of course. It was like a split of a second. And how about 16 to the power of six? Yeah, six, exactly. You're absolutely right. Because five times five is 25, and five times five is 25, and six times six is 36, and again, times six is 36. So I always get the same number. Well, now, guess what? This is actually quite easy now. Because all I needed to figure out was, was 14 to the power of four. And if I knew there was a pattern, it would have been a lot easier, right? but it, it took me some time to figure out that part then, but that's okay, we're here to learn. So now I have a number that ends in a six, the second number ends in a five, the third number ends in a six. And if we add them up, that strategy works for addition as well, then we get a seven. Oh, thank you, Carol, you're saying this is amazing. Awesome, I'm really glad that you liked it. And now of course, only one answer choice ends in a seven and we can literally do this in just two minutes. 
So this strategy should be one of your staple strategies, the units digit strategy. Now, of course, there's certain scenarios where you could use it and certain scenarios where you can't, but this is an awesome scenario because we can't really calculate that number. That's impossible within two minutes. The units digits of the answer choices are all different or sufficiently different. And we also know there's a strategy that we can actually use and we can do this really quickly. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I have a question for you. Is there a way to do this question even faster? So we can do this in two minutes and maybe a minute, but what if you have just 15 seconds left? And this is the last question of your exam. And you literally you just have to get it right. Maybe it's 30 seconds left. So maybe you don't have time for this units digit strategy. So let me show you another way. Let's call it the mastery way of doing this question. This is when you really master this process. And um, let me ask you a question. And <laughs> you can put it in the chat box if you want. I will see your chat, nobody else will see. But can you tell me if you are just maybe a little bit of a risk taker? Just let me know. What do you think? Maybe you play poker at some point or maybe, yeah, awesome. A few people are saying, yes, I am. Well, let me show you a scenario where you're gonna take a little bit of a risk. And by the way, remember we're trying to get into a business school. Getting into a business school is maybe a little bit of a risk because you get into something unknown. And when you're going to become a manager or a CEO, sometimes you have to take risks. So that's what we're gonna do here. And remember, we have very limited time. So here's what we're gonna do. We'll look at the question, but we're also going to look at the answer choices. And in the answer choices, there's something we can notice. What we're going to notice is something that's actually quite important. And that was that the answer choices were quite far apart. I don't know if you noticed that when you looked at it at first, most people do not look at the answer choices. They just try to solve the problem and then look at the answer choices and try to match their answer with the answer choices. But what if we did look at the answer choices? We would actually notice that, that the answer choices are apart. So what does this mean when the answer choices are apart? This means that if I get an approximate answer, that's probably good enough. That's what it means. Because look, if, I, if, if I'm at like 6 million and not four, I still know the answer is B. So can anybody tell me please in the chat box, if I were to approximate that answer, would I approximate all three of these numbers or would I maybe start with only one of them? Or maybe I'm just going to approximate only one of them. Ah, yes. Yeah, so L, yeah, but Pranay is saying, I'm gonna approximate just one. And I imagine that you were going to approximate the last one. And Ellie is saying, uh, well, how about C and D? What's going on there, right? And uh, Ellie, I think you're probably uh, trying to hint that, well, if we were to approximate the answers, well, how about C and D? What would happen if we get somewhere around C and D? And in fact, this is something interesting. Now we're starting to notice how the GMAT sets up traps. And one of the traps is they know some people are just going to approximate. They also know that 16 to the six is actually a very easy number to approximate because 16 is a power of two. And if you learn your powers of two, you will know that two to the power of 10 is actually about a thousand and 16 is two to the power of four. So 16 to the six is two to the power of 24, which means there's about 16 million. You can literally, like with enough skill, you can do this in your head in five seconds. You can estimate what 16 to the power of six. That's about 16 million. But how about C and D? So now I'm a little stuck. And what the GMAT hopes we're going to do is go back and try to actually calculate the number. But we're going to try to use the GMAT trick against the GMAT. We'll take a little bit of a leap of faith and we'll say, I think that the answer is C or D. Just because how the GMAT works, you know, I'm playing poker and I know that the GMAT sometimes bluffs. And this is exactly what the GMAT does right now. 
So if I don't have more time, I'm just going to go with this understanding that the answer is C or D. And now can anybody tell me in the chat box, if I have 10 seconds left, is there any way for me to break the tie between C and D? So assuming we all agree that it's C or D, and of course, this will always be the case, but most of the time, and if we're a little bit of a risk taker, we'll take the chances, right? Remember, this is the last question. We have 10 seconds left, so we don't really have to do any, we, we don't really have time to do anything else. So can anybody tell me in the chat box, C or D and why? There's actually a way to break that tie. Ah, yes, thank you, Ellie. Uh, and I have a couple more comments. Yes, you guys are absolutely right. Now we can actually see that one of these numbers is even and another one is odd. Well, the original question was even plus odd plus even. And of course that gives us an odd number. So now the answer has to be D. And we can get that question done in 30 seconds with a 90% confidence that we got it right. Hey, you know, 90% in 30 seconds, this is the last question, I'll take that bet. So that's what I was talking about when I was talking a little bit of a, being sometimes a risk taker. Because sometimes you look at the question and you're saying, well, wait a second, I, I can't really do this. Like, I don't have eight minutes, so I'm just gonna do my best. I'll do the best that I possibly can within the time that I have. I want to maximize my chance of success, just like what we do in the, in the business, right? Uh, we don't know whether the rocket's gonna fly into space, but we'll take a chance and we'll maximize our rate of success. Well, I hope you enjoyed these different ways of doing this question. So that actually brings us to an important point. And we'll do a few more questions, by the way, but I wanted to step back and share with you what really separates the 500 and the 700 plus course. So this question is, of course, much more difficult than the first question we've done. But the questions look the same. And what's going to make the difference is how we approach the questions. In fact, the GMAC, people who make the test, here's what they would say. And you can ask any of them. And I know a few people who actually develop questions. We get invited to the GMAC headquarters every year. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed to, to have that privilege. And I mean, you can't buy a ticket. You just get invited, right? If they know that you're doing a good job training people for the GMAC. So at some point they reached out to us and said, we would really love for you to come and spend some time at the headquarters with us. So we can share a few things with you with us. And uh, what they said is, look, please understand. And please make sure that all of your clients understand that this is not a knowledge-based exam. This is going to be different compared to most of the other exams we've done before. If we are doing an exam, a traditional exam, let's say, you know, I have a master's in mathematics or a bachelor in physics. So if I were to do a physics exam, well, I need to know some physics, right? I mean, that just makes sense. But if I'm doing a GMAT exam to get into a business school, I do not need to know any business. Instead, I need to demonstrate my reasoning skills. And this, the skills are what's actually going to help me do well in the business school. Now, unfortunately, when we were in our school, most of us have developed a lot of bad habits. That's just how our school system works. We picked up some good habits, but we also developed a lot of bad habits. And one of the bad habits or bad incantations that perhaps we learned from some of our instructors is that knowledge is power. So if we memorize things, we are now going to become powerful. And that perhaps were true or was true before we had internet. Now, I grew up when we didn't have internet, when I was in actually my middle school. But, but now we have Google and we have all these search engines. So now if I know something, I don't have any advantage. Everybody else can know this. So what is actually power right now? Well, the power is our ability to use that knowledge. It's the skill of being able to apply the knowledge. And I love analogies. So I'm going to share with you a few analogies throughout the class tonight. And one of the analogies is that the GMAT is almost like a sport. I don't know if you guys are watching Olympics, but you know when you're competing in the Olympics, you're demonstrating a skill, right? And you probably trained a lot. You had a really good coach. You invested lots of time. And now you're actually showing how to swim or you're showing 
you know, how to ski or how to play football, or soccer. But it wasn't just about reading a book and memorizing the rules of swimming. It was about getting into a pool and it was about swimming and it was about maybe seeing what's, what's working and what's not working. And that's exactly what we're doing now. So as you're doing the question, try to see, okay, so where did things go wrong? And if we work together, if you come to our GMAT mastery program, then we'll actually do a lot of this together and I'll be able to give you some coaching. But here today, as long as you participate, as long as you throw things in the chat box, I'll be giving you some coaching. I'll be sharing with you a few ideas of how you can actually improve and develop that skill. But please keep that at the back of your mind that training for the GMAT is going to be almost like training for any sport. The only difference is unlike the Olympics, almost everybody can be a winner. Almost everybody can get a good score as long as you're dedicated enough. There's no first, second, and third place. So here for, the, for this very short class, I'm your coach and I'm actually very grateful that you came here to spend some time tonight. Uh, what qualifies me, by the way, to be your coach here for this short time and hopefully for much longer if we work together is I've done really well in my GMAT and I've done that after about two weeks of studying. By the way, if you would like to know how exactly I studied, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily something that everybody can follow, but if you want to know exactly what I did, then please come to our verbal refresher class in two weeks and I'll tell you exactly what resources I've used. I, and today I'm gonna share with you a few different things. Uh, but in case you're wondering, well, gee, Sergey scored in the top 1% after two weeks of studying, he's probably some sort of a genius. And the answer is not, absolutely not. I am not a genius. And uh, just like I mentioned for full disclosure, I do have a master's of mathematics and a bachelor of physics. I went to um, an institute that's almost like the MIT. I don't know if you guys heard of MIT, a uh, very prestigious science university in the former Soviet Union. Uh, but I wasn't like coming up with these famous formulas. I'm not an Einstein. How I was able to do so well on the GMAT is actually not because there was something special I learned in my university, but it was because when I was in my middle school and in my high school, I got very lucky with teachers. And this was my math teacher who was literally, he was just so gifted as a teacher that he taught me and all of the children in the class to really think, out, think outside the box. He taught us the strategies that you can't find in a high school textbook. And as a result, I, I did really well in almost any standardized test. I've uh, participated in some Olympic games in math and physics and programming, all kinds of other cool things. And um, after I've done my MBA, which was my third degree already, I actually, after some time, I worked for a big company and then I became a GMAT instructor by accident. And I realized, number one, I really love it. And number two, my students came to me and said that they really liked the way I teach and they came to my former boss. So I just became a full-time instructor after some time. And I've been doing this now full-time for seven years. I've been teaching the GMAT for about 12 years. And what my goal is, is to number one, make sure you enjoy the study process. And number two, you learn a lot of cool strategies. What I've learned from my teachers and what I've learned from a lot of other teachers, I always have teachers, even now, I work with a lot of people who I think are smarter than me. And one of the, one of the reasons why I make this claim is I actually have the lowest score among all instructors here at Admit Master. I have just 750, everybody else has 750, 770, or 760, 770, or 780. Uh, but what we teach in our class is, is really how to think outside the box. And I wanted to show you just maybe one example here from Daria. I was just speaking with her a few days ago. She's starting her program at the London Business School in, in literally a few days. Uh, and originally her score was not very high at all, but she came to our class, she was super dedicated. And she said, look, I need to learn how to think outside the box. That's what the GMAT is gonna be about. She came to actually one of these classes and she said, this is what I need. And what she learned over three months with us is how to approach these questions, how to manage time and stress, which is really important. And we're gonna get back to this and I'll give you some strategies as well. And ultimately how to think differently, how to think on a totally higher level. What we call here at Admit Master, think like a CEO. And I'm actually going to show you exactly how to think like a CEO. And of course, we're supporting her along the way, even with her application 
and she applied to four top schools in Europe and she got into all four of them and she chose LBS. So what we've already done here today and I'm, I'm gonna share with you where we're going as well. So we did a couple of questions to challenge you to get outside of your comfort zone. We talked about what separates the 500 and 700 scores which is the skill, right? The, not just the knowledge, the theoretical knowledge but the skill. Uh, we started learning some practical quant strategies. We've already learned a couple. We learned estimation. We've also learned uh, units digit strategy. I'm going to share with you a few more. I will give you the step-by-step -step one to get to a 700 plus score. I'll share with you a few resources to help you study at home. And then we're going to have a special guest from the Ivy Business School at Western University in London, Ontario, uh, J.D. Clark, who's an executive director of recruitment I love these tips that JD is going to share. And actually what we did tonight, which is a very special time, is we, we've collected a few questions that we got from our students and I will do a, literally an interview with JD here on camera tonight. And you get to be a part of that interview and you're not gonna be on camera, so don't worry. Uh, but I on JD will be, and I'll ask him a few questions. And if you have any questions for JD as well about how to get into Ivy or how the whole application process works, just put it in the Q&A box and we'll make sure to address them as well. And at the end, uh, we'll stay as long as we need to for Q&A and I'll give you a few bonuses as well. Some of the resources, some of the free resources, some of the affordable resources that are going to help you get the way you need to be. All right. So now that we know what we're actually going to do, now let me show you and this is something that I'm sure that most of you have seen before, but I want to show you this from a different perspective. And this is the format of the test. Now, you know, there are four sections on the test. And when I ask, I do a lot of consultations and I do a lot of these seminars, honestly. And when I ask our future clients, well, tell me what the section, what sections on the exam do you know? Most of the people are going to say, ah, there are, you know, four sections. And there's an essay and there's the mass and the English and there's something else. But here's something important is uh, there actually is no word mass. We see analytical section, we see integrated reasoning, we see quantitative reasoning, we see verbal reasoning section. So it's really all about how we think. It's how about how we analyze things, how we reason. It's all about the logic. So even in the names of the section, the GMAT tells us, ah, we're gonna do something different here. We're gonna find a way to reason through the problems. And we'll do, I'll show you a couple more examples how you can actually do this. Now, how the GMAT actually does this is it breaks the sections down into different types of questions. Now, the two sections that contribute toward your total score, 200 to 800, are the quantitative reasoning and the verbal reasoning sections. So tonight, we're actually talking about the quantitative reason section, and there are two types of questions, problem solving, which is already seen, we'll see some more, and data sufficiency, which we're also are going to see tonight. So that's today. And where we're going next is in two weeks, we're going to have a verbal reasoning uh, uh, section workshop, uh, our verbal refresher class, where we'll talk about sense correction, critical reason, and reading comprehension. Now, you remember we talked about getting the questions right and wrong right at the very beginning. And one of the things I mentioned is that at some point you're gonna get, start getting questions wrong. And that is why the test is adaptive. So the algorithm that the GMAT uses is if you get the question right, your next question will generally be harder. And if you get the question wrong, your next question will generally be easier. That's how the test works. So at some point, the questions are gonna go, get so hard that you'll probably start getting the questions wrong. And that's completely okay. That also means that we have to have the right frame of mind that you know, sometimes I will take the risk and I will just play this game that I just wanna try to get as many questions right as possible. That's really it. I can't get all of them right. I'm just gonna get as many as I possibly can. So that's important. And it's also important to know what to expect on the GMAT because if I know that the questions are going to get progressively harder, but I'm not getting more time, 
I need to know the strategies that are going to help me save this time. And I'll show, with you, show you a couple of more strategies tonight that are going to help you save time. But I want to ask you a question now, because I've been talking for a while. Why do you think is mass on the GMAT hard? And perhaps uh, I'm going to launch a quick poll just so that I can hear from you. Why do you think the mass is hard? What's hard about the GMAT mass specifically? Okay, I'm seeing here, uh, most of you are saying time pressure. Very little time per question. So time management is actually really important. That's why here in this workshop, every minute of this workshop is, is timed and, and planned. Because if you come here to this workshop, and I know you didn't pay anything to be here in this workshop, but you've dedicated two hours of your time. And if, if you're trying to get into a business school and and of course, I know you're very serious about getting into business school. And if you think like a manager, you know that time is actually so much more important than money. If somebody asked me to spend two hours doing something I don't like versus maybe giving them $20 or $100, I'd rather give them the money and save my time because I can never get the time back, but I can always get the money back. Uh, yeah, somebody was saying, uh, well, some of the rules that we use on the GMAT are the rules we don't really use every day. For example, I don't really use prime numbers every day. I don't really use odd and even numbers every day. And that brings us to that point that it's been a while since I've done this sort of a math. Many people are saying, well, you know, I'm not really a math person and uh, time pressure is, is still the most popular answer. So thanks so much for sharing this. These are all really good reasons. And these are all valid reasons. So how are we going to conquer this? How are we going to attack this? And how do we actually manage our time? Well, let's do a question, shall we? I think it's time that we do the next question. And this is now going to be an algebra question. It's going to be another problem solving question. And again, the only thing I'm going to ask you is please do not Google this question. Please do not use a calculator. Use your pen and paper do this question. So here's how the question is going to look like. And then of course, we'll talk about this question. We'll talk about the time management and everything else. So here's the question. You have a certain table or a chart, and then there's a question about this chart. And here's the question. And of course, we have the answer choices. And here are the answer choices. So I'll be quiet for about a minute and a half. And I'll let you work on this question. And as always, I'm going to ask you for your answer. There you go.
All right. Well, believe it or not, it has been a minute and 45 seconds. So I'll give you 15 more seconds. I noticed many, many people on this call still have not chosen the answer. Uh, so please choose an answer, whichever one works the best to you. Doesn't really matter which one. And I'm going to end the poll now because it's been two minutes. So there we go. All right, let me share the results with you. As you could see, most people have chosen D. A few people for C, E, or A. So please keep that in mind. Where we'll figure out how to do this question in just a couple of moments. Now, if I look to how most people study, and this is a question, by the way, from the official GMAT guide. So what do most people do when they look at this question? They have two minutes, which is what you normally have, and then they did not get this right. So obviously only one of these is right. So imagine that somebody didn't get this right. What would they do? Can somebody tell me in the chat box? What do most people do when they don't get the question right? <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. Most of you are saying, I'm going to read the explanation. So this is how the explanation works. And uh, this is what you're probably going to see at some point when you're doing this question. At some point, I would maybe imagine that most of you had a formula that looked something like this. Or maybe you didn't have this formula, but you maybe were trying to create this sort of a formula. Because what's going on here is we know that there's a total number of marbles. And we also know that there's a certain percentage of marbles in each of the bags, which are blue. So if we take 37, which is the number of marbles in bag P, and we multiply it by 10.8%, which is 10.8 divided by 100. And then we have X and 66.7% and 32 and 50%. And if we add all of these up, we are going to get a number of blue marbles. So the next thing we're going to do is we'll say, OK, but if we calculate the total, then we need to know that the total, then the, the total is 37 plus X plus 32, and a third of them is actually the number of blue marbles. So the left side gives us a number of blue marbles. The right side gives us a number of blue marbles. And uh, God bless us that we can find the answer in two minutes or whatever you believe in. And then hopefully, we'll actually find the right answer. We'll find out in a moment if we did. This, to me, you know, this is a lot of hard work. And you know, I, I love hardworking people. And uh, we. That, that's really important. And you know, if I ask you, are you a hardworking person? You'll probably say, yes, I am. You know, I work so hard, but this to me, this is the work hard way of doing this question. See, doing things the hard way isn't necessarily going to get us to the right answer in two minutes. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. By the way, how difficult is this question? What do you think? Is this a difficult question, yes or no? Can somebody throw it in the chat box? Ah, wow, wow. I'm impressed, actually, that most of you are saying this is a medium or a, a, an easy question. If we were to go, yeah, yeah, some of you are saying, OK. So I actually looked this question up on GMAT Club, you know, where there are a lot of people that are trying to share some ideas, and they rank the question, and they also see how many people get that question right. And based on this, they actually say, oh, this is an easy question. This is a hard question. So just in case you're wondering, or if you're interested, this is question number 161 from the official guide 2021 or 2022. So feel free to look it up on the GMAT Club, and you will see this is a very hard question. That's how it's classified. Very hard basically means, well, don't try unless you're an expert. Right? That's what they say. OK. Now, if this is the work hard way, is there a different way? Well, let's see. Maybe we can do something here to try to simplify this problem a little bit. Because I was given a table. What if we take that table and extend it a little bit? What if I were to say, OK, well, I'd like to know if I was told that I have 37 marbles and 10.8 of them are blue, 
then how many blue marbles do I actually have in back P? Can anybody tell me? Oh, exactly. All of you are saying four. Of course, it's a little over 10%. And the, the number of marbles has to be indivisible because you know I can have half a marble. So that is four. Well, in back Q, I have 66.7%. By the way, 66.7 as a fraction. Does anybody know what it is? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's two thirds of X. How about bug R? How many blue marbles do I have in bug R? Exactly, I got 16 blue marbles. So let me ask you a question. And we're starting to work smart now. Can you please tell me what do we know about the number of marbles in back Q so far? Is there anything that we know about the number of marbles in back Q? which is what the question is about. Something we already know. It's not two thirds of the total. 66% of them are blue, yes. So what does this tell us about the number of, yeah, more of them are blue. Okay, what else do we know? Yeah, I have the greatest amount. Well, what else do we know? If two thirds of them are blue, Yes, thank you. Nastasia is saying it needs to be divisible by three. So let me ask you a question. What answer choices are not divisible by three? Because if two thirds of them need to be blue. Wow, Carol is saying, wow, amazing, right? A, D, and E are all out. So now we're down to B and C. Now remember, most people chose D, by the way. Hmm, so what do we do now? We have two answer choices left. So let me ask you a question. Maybe at this point, we can just try one of them and see if it's right. So how many do we need to try now? We have two left. How many do we need to actually try, one or both? Just one, yes, you're right, just one, because if we have one, two left, only one of them could be right. So let's try one. Somebody was saying, let's try C. Okay, so sure, let's try C. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pretend that X is 12. So let's plug it in into back into our chart. So now we have 12. What's two thirds of 12? Yeah, exactly, that's eight. All right, so now, why don't we calculate the total and see if that's what we need? How many of the marbles do we have in total? Can anybody tell me real quick? Without the calculator, total number of marbles is? Yes, thank you. Wow, that's, that's impressive, 81. And how many blue marbles do we have? Wow, I'm so impressed. 28, yes, it is 28. Now, is 28 one third of 81, yes or no? It has to be a third. If 12 is the right answer, then 28 is supposed to be a third of 81, is it? Yes or no, what do you think? No, it's not. 28 is not a third of 81. It's supposed to be, but it's not. So is 12 the right answer then? No, it's not. And what's the right answer? Yeah, it has to be nine, it has to be B. By the way, nobody chose B. By the way, I didn't even, yeah, exactly. Nobody actually answered that uh, question correctly. So that's okay, we're gonna learn something. By the way, I didn't even have to calculate 81 because 37 plus 12 plus 32 is some odd number. And four plus eight plus 16 is some even number. And an even number cannot be a third of the odd number, right? A third of the odd number is always odd. So I didn't even have to calculate this. I know that 12 is not the right answer. Nine has to be the right answer. Will I check nine? Absolutely not. That's the only one that's left. So let me ask you a question. 
How much algebra did we do? This is an algebra question. Remember, it was classified as very difficult. So how much algebra did we do? Uh, we did a little bit of arithmetic, but no algebra. So what's the chance that we're going to make a mathematical mistake? I don't know the answer to this question, but you can maybe tell me. Yeah, you, a few people are saying none. Yeah, very small. I mean, if we can divide 32 by, by 2 or 12 by multiply by 2 thirds. So, uh, so which approach would you enjoy more? And more importantly, let me ask you a question. What do you think a successful manager or CEO would do? Somebody who's a CEO, would they prefer one approach or the other approach? And, and most importantly, exactly, it's the smarter approach. And most importantly, when you can ask yourself when you're studying for the GMAT, am I the sort of a person who prefers to work hard or am I the kind of person who prefers to work smart? And that's really important. And I don't have that answer for you. And that's something you need to decide. And thinking about speaking, or speaking about thinking like a CEO. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everybody's saying, well, definitely the smarter approach for sure. Now, thinking, speaking about thinking like a CEO, let me, let's do one more question. I promise that we'll do a data sufficiency question. I will say one more question at the end as well. So let's do a data sufficiency question. By the way, if you have not ever seen a data sufficiency question, don't worry, uh, you'll see one now. So this data sufficiency question, I'm gonna ask you to think, try to think a little outside the box. I'll give you about a minute to think about this question. The way this question is gonna look like is you have a question and you have a question in a question, but you don't actually need to answer this question, which is really interesting. Instead, all you need to do is figure out if it is possible to answer this question. And this is kind of like a manager thinking, right? If I'm a manager, I don't necessarily need to do the work all by myself. I just need to figure out if it is possible to do the work and then other people are gonna do the work. So who's gonna do the work? My statements. So if I have a question, all I need to understand is whether statements one or two or together are sufficient to answer this question. That is why in a data sufficiency question, I don't honestly don't care if you can tell me the number, that's the answer to this question. All I need to know is which of the statements you need to answer the question. And you have the answer choices in front of you. They're always the same. They do not change in data sufficiency questions. So uh, you can do some math if you'd like, you don't have to. Just figure out which statements do you need to answer this question, and I'll give you about a minute. has been a minute, but I've noticed that very, very few people answer that question. So I'll give you another 15 seconds. We'll go to a minute and a half. All right, let me end the poll right now. Let me share the results with you. As you could see, C seems a very popular answer here. It stands for correct, by the way. C stands for correct, so that's why it's the most popular. By the way, it is the most popular answer on the GMAT, statistically, 
but uh, realistically, it's right only 20%. But statistically, more people choose C more often. So let's see if C is actually the right answer. Now, again, there are different ways of approaching this question. This is another question from the official GMAT guide. So if you look at the official explanation, here's how it looks like. Let R be the regular price and D be the discounted price and P1 be the profit one and P2 be the profit two and oh my God. I need a master's degree to even understand this. By the way, you might be wondering if you've spent some time with the official guide, why is the official guide so terrible in explanations? And that is exactly why you do really need a master's degree to understand the official guide because the explanations in the official guide are not written to help you break the test. They are written essentially for legal purposes. The GMAT needs to theoretically prove, just like we proved theorems in our school, that this is the right answer so that nobody can go after them and say, oh, wait a second, you didn't actually prove to me. I still don't believe this is the right answer. So that's what they do, but they don't actually teach us how to do it. So let's think like a CEO. Let's think a little bit differently here. If I'm a manager of this store, let me try to understand or let us try to understand what's going on. Now, if somebody walks into our store and buys one shirt, we're gonna make a certain amount of money, a certain profit. But if somebody walks in and buys two shirts, what we're gonna do is we will make exactly the same profit. That's what the question was explaining, right? That was right in the middle. We make the same profit from two shirts as we make from one shirt. So what does this mean? That means that we want to create an incentive for our customers to buy two shirts. And by the way, if you walk into a store and you see the second shirt on sale, are you more likely to even buy the shirt in the first place? Probably yes, right? It's not that important for this question, but this is just some, there's some business rationale for what they've done. But what's important is to understand that we're making exactly the same profit from two shirts as we are from one shirt. That means the profit is all from the first shirt. There is actually no profit from the second shirt. Right? Get so far? Now, if we're making no profit from the second shirt, that means we're selling the second shirt at cost. Right? Because the profit is revenue minus cost. If the profit is zero, that means revenue is equal to cost. That means we're making no money on the second shirt. That means that whatever price we're selling the second shirt for to the customer, that is the cost to us. Make sense? So far? Okay. All right. So let's see which of the statements do we actually need in order to answer this question. We're going to be looking for something that tells us something about the discounted price or maybe something about the cost. Let's take a look at statement number one. Statement one tells us that the regular price was $16. All right, well, that, that's interesting, but by itself, it is definitely not enough. I need to know the discounted price or I need to know something about the cost. I just know the regular price. That's not sufficient. How about statement two? What do you think? Can anybody tell me in the chat box, what do you think about the statement two? Statement two tells me that the cost to the store of each of the shirts was $12. Is that enough? Yes or no? Okay, a few people are saying no and a few people are saying yes. So remember we did our analysis We've actually figured that the price that we, the discounted price of the second shirt is actually equal to the cost to the customer. And the question was, what was the discounted price of the shirt? Sorry, it was equal to the cost to the store. So we buy the shirt for a certain number of dollars, the $12, and we're selling it to a customer for $12 and we're making zero profit. That is why the cost to the closing store is exactly what we need because that's the price with which we're going to sell the shirt to a customer, the second shirt. And because this gives us exactly what we need, statement two is sufficient. And that's why the answer is B. 
Nobody actually chose D. And that's okay. Like we agreed. We're not going to have the right answers here, but there are the answers we can learn. So what can we learn? We've learned that before we jump into the statements, we need to do a little bit of analysis. We've learned that perhaps thinking at a higher level, thinking like a manager is going to be important. Perhaps understanding what does it mean that we're making no profit from the second shirt and profit is revenue minus cost. This is one of the very few business formulas that we actually need to know, but it is very basic. And we can literally do this in one minute. Now, of course, many of us haven't necessarily been thinking that way or approaching the questions that way. And honestly, to do this on a real test is going to require some confidence. It's going to require lots of practice and building up the confidence as well. And when we are studying a lot, and sometimes when we're not seeing progress, our confidence begins to suffer. In fact, let me share with you a story of one of our clients. Uh, Darine is from Montreal, and she's been studying for about four years. She told me that she has these books, or she had these books on her shelf, and she was pulling up these books once in a while. She was doing the question. She understood that the test is really difficult, and then she would put the books back on the shelf. You might relate to this. And what eventually helped her is two things. Number one, having the right structure. If she, needed, if she knew what she needs to do every single week, how many questions she needs to do, uh, what questions she needs to do, and being a part of a community where somebody is guiding her, but also somebody is having her back, but also somebody is behind, beside her so that she can actually study with other people as well. And that was a real game changer. She was able to achieve her results in just three months. And this is not an isolated example. I've shown you Daria who got from 380 to 700. Well, Darini was actually in the same class with her. And what was important is, especially for Darini, because she built up so much anxiety over these four years, she didn't even want to touch the GMAT. Just a friend recommended that she join our class. And she's like, you my only hope. I said, wow, I feel like a Jedi, but Sure, let's work on this together. And, and that was important. So she needed to have a plan. And most of our students would have a plan week by week. Darini had a plan day by day. And that's how she achieved her goal. So how do, how do most people study? And, and how could we actually study? There are different ways to study, by the way. And not one way works for everyone. So let me share with you a few different ways, and then you get to decide whichever one works better for you. Now, how most people study is what we call a trial and error approach. And what this means is we're going to try something. Let's say we're going to try a question, and let's say we get this question wrong, and we're going to go and try to find a better way, and then we're going to try something else, and we're going to try to find a better way. And this is kind of like if you remember maybe. Sometime in your childhood, if you've been in, in a corn maze, maybe with your parents or your siblings, and if you haven't, that's okay. Maybe you grew up where there is no corn. Maybe you can just imagine a corn maze. So the corn maze is you're standing right in front and you can go either way and every turn you can go somewhere else. So this is kind of like trial and error. And how long is it gonna take us to actually get to the other side? Well, we don't know, right? If we get lucky, maybe we'll get there quickly. We can hope we get there quickly, but hope is not a good strategy for the GMAT. Now, sometimes, by the way, trial and error is an awesome strategy. It's an awesome strategy when we're working on something that has not been done before. If you're Thomas Edison trying to invent a lamp, nobody has done it before, then of course we need to try things and see what works and what doesn't work. But if it's been done many times before, why don't we, instead of trying things ourselves, why don't we learn what already works? That's, that's where I'm going with this, right? And again, you can decide what works for you, but this is just to put things in perspective. By the way, uh, this is, I, I wanted to show you an interesting graph, which was also shared with, with me and a few other people at the GMAT, this closed GMAT conference, where the GMAT was actually sharing with us how many people get scores of 700 or more? By the way, does anybody know how many people get scores of 700? And it's obviously you cannot fail the GMAT. Uh, you always get a score. So does anybody know how many people actually do get the score of 700 or more? 
as Ellie saying 1%, Ryan right, saying 10%. Uh, okay, so uh, if you look at the MBA.com, then you would see that 700 is the 12, uh, 88th percentile, which means that 12% of people get 700 and 88% you know, of people don't. So if we look at this, we say, okay, so what's my chance of getting a score of 700? It's gotta be 12%, right? And again, uh, this is not a game of chance. This is something we have control over. But what was interesting is that there's the metric that the GMAT uses. And a, a few years ago, they started keeping tabs of this. In the past, they were just saying, you know, how many people take the test and how many people get a score of 700. That's an easy metrics. But what they've decided to do is actually figure out how many people study for the test, but don't do the test. And it was really interesting that they found and they shared with us probably a couple of years ago, the first time they did it. So they said, well, about 7 million people a year explore the GMAT, which means they go on uh, the GMAT website or there's some other websites uh, where people actually explore what it's like to study for the GMAT. And there's 7 million unique visitors going to these websites, the few websites that belong to the GMAT, mba.com, the GMAT, and so on. 7 million unique people. Of these 7 million people, what they've calculated is about 2 million people a year is a buy a GMAT book or download the practice test. Now, if I buy a book or download the practice test, well, I, that probably means that I'm getting, now getting a little more serious, right? I, I invest some time and possibly some money into actually studying for the GMAT. Now, how many people of those 2 million actually end up doing the real test? I was shocked when they showed me these numbers and it's just 10%. So 90% of people would have these resources, would do a few things, and then they'll just say, oh, that's too difficult, that's not for me, or you know, I give up, trial and error doesn't work, and they just fall off. That means that these, these might be the people who have the, one of the most brilliant ideas, and they want to take our world to the next level, they want to maybe create a new company, and maybe they just need the education, and they've just given up, maybe got stuck to where they are. And of these people, only 12% end up doing, getting a score of 700. So if you look at everybody who is just saying, okay, let's do the GMAT, that would be such a great idea. Let me do some research to the people who actually do the test. That's less than one in 300. That's crazy, right? Now, what if we have this maze that we need to navigate, but what if, I gave you a map. What do you think? Would now we have a much better chance of success in actually getting out? And is it gonna take us less time? What do you think? Just put it in a chat box. What if you, I, all I did is just gave you a map. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Andre is saying, yes, if I have a map, let's do it now. Oh my God, now I know exactly where I need to go. I mean, I might still make a wrong turn because I don't necessarily always know exactly where I am, but I'll definitely get there a lot quicker because I don't have to do trial and error and figure out things that have been done many times before. And this might be one of the ways for you to study. And by the way, of course, I'll relate it back to the GMAT. But is there an even better way? And yes, there is. What if, you have somebody who already has been there before. And if somebody is gonna hold your hand and say, let's go, let's walk this maze together. Now, some of you might be saying, well, the actual process of being in a maze and making all these turns, that's actually a lot of fun. So I wanna spend as much time as I possibly can and just play around in a maze. But I imagine that most of you, when it comes to the GMAT, don't really want to spend too much time studying for the GMAT, right? You wanna to get to the other side, and that's why if, if you are the sort of person who values this time and you're the sort of person who generally prefers to have a guide, you know, I, I, I know when I'm going, let's say, to a new city, sometimes I can just walk the city, I'll go look at the buildings, I'll say, wow, this is really wonderful. I remember I was in Barcelona. I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. That's really beautiful. But then I took a tour around Barcelona and I'm like, oh my God, 
like this building actually was built by someone and this is exactly the same style that's in the other building and that's why and there's some history behind it and all of a sudden I'm enjoying it a lot more. Exactly, yeah, you just basically you just follow the plan. So if you're the sort of person who likes to just follow a guide and follow the plan and get to the other side as quickly as possible, then you could join our live program. This is what we call the all-inclusive live training. And this is, this is really the program that's designed for people who want to get scores of 700 or more. And the way that it works is essentially, uh, you're going to be in a class for about six to 12 weeks. It's going to be a much smaller class. It's live, it's interactive. We'll give you all the study materials. We're literally are going to hold your hand and we'll walk you through everything. And because we know what you're doing as well, we, we kind of have a view of, of everything. Even everything you're doing online, we can have a, a view. And of course, in a class, you can always ask questions. And with this program, we'll coach you until you are done. That's really our promise. And there are a couple of different formats. There's a format on weekends where you could uh, join on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there's a format on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 to 10 p.m. If, if this is an Eastern time. And uh, it's, it's approximately fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars I can get to up to about 1700 Canadian dollars. It's a little bit less than US dollars. And it's, uh, it's really the program that's designed to give you everything that you need from start to finish. So if you're the sort of person who likes this, this is an amazing option for you. Now, there are other options as well. If you're the sort of a person who just likes to get a map, then another thing that you could do is get the program that will give you the map, but perhaps won't have as much support, perhaps won't really necessarily have that live person who's going to be walking with you. And again, you have to decide this. I'm, I'm not the person who can make this decision for you. It's really something that you have to just feel what's right for you. And let me just show you a couple of different options that you could take. So our live course is you're going to be in a live class and the way that you're going to study is basically being in a live class. You can ask any questions either in class or we have office hours every week as well. You have three private classes, lots of questions to practice. And most people, when they take a live class, study for about three to four months and improve their score by about 150 points or more. You know, maybe up to 300 points. And the regular price for this course is 1,700 Canadian dollars, 1,500 US. Now I know that, I mean, it is a significant investment, but honestly, 1,500 dollars never stopped anyone from doing an MBA because an MBA, I don't know if you looked at, at any statistics, the MBA from a top school will bring returns of like in millions of dollars. An, an average return on investment on an MBA program in North America is $3 million and some of the programs uh, bring more. Like if you look at Stanford, it's somewhere around $8 million. So I know $1,500 is not going to stop anyone. Well, what will sometimes is the lack of time. And that's why I want to, you to be very efficient with your time and really look, look at everything as in, in perspective. And also uh, just again, what we see a lot from our students is that if you get a good score, you will probably get a fairly significant entrance scholarship. And that's also important. Now, we want you to get an immediate return on investment. And of course, there's lots of other benefits, such as if you get a good score, you can apply to uh, work at some of the competitive firms like McKinsey, if that's what you want, or maybe Goldman Sachs, investment banks. They typically will ask you for a higher GMAT score. Well, some of you might say, okay, I, I want a map and I want to be able to call or email the instructor anytime I need help, anytime I get stuck, I want that support, but I don't need the instructor to be there with me all the time. I just need a map. So what this means is that this is the program in the middle. This is where we give you recorded classes. You have support with the instructor by phone or email. You still get to three private classes. And it normally for most people takes about five to six months, but again, that's a typical study time. Right? That's somebody who studies like 10, 15 hours a week. If you have 40 hours a week, you can probably do this a lot faster. You're saving a little bit of money, honestly, not so much. So if you prefer to be in a live class, I would very much encourage you to be in a live class. This is a much more popular class. But if you can't come to a live class, like we have some students who work shifts 
And so they, you know, they work three days and they sleep for three days. Then you cannot come to a live class. Then the on-demand option might work better. The GMAT Express option is where we give you the map and you're on your own. You learn the same things, by the way. The strategies are exactly the same, but we break things down into modules. And then you work all by yourself, but you have the exercises, you have lots of practice questions. And then typically what we find is most people spend about six to 12 months studying again, that varies. But with that program, the minimum we've seen is about three months, just because there's still things to figure out. And most people improve by fewer points because you don't have that personal touch. And it is a lot more affordable. If you go on our website, I'll show you a link. You actually see uh, that if you get it for a year, it works out to be um, like a, even, I'll, I'll give you a, a discount code. It, it's actually works out, working out to be about $50 a month. And if it's for a year, for a month, it works out to be just over $100. So these are the three options. Again, you can decide what works better for you. But what I, I speak with a lot of people and sometimes when I, when I do a consultation or where I speak with somebody and I say, okay, well, these are the options or this is how you can study. And by the way, we'd love for you to come and join here as here at Admit Master, but other companies offer these options as well. Just ours are affordable and we really care about your success. Uh, we are a medium-sized company uh, from North America. So we would love for you to work with us and uh, th this sort of strategies we teach are really cool. And many of these strategies aren't really taught anywhere else. But when I ask people, well, well okay, what do you think about, uh, about these ways of studies? What I usually hear from many people is, ah, don't worry. I can do the trial and error because I got lots of what? What do you think? What do most people say? I can do a lot of trial and error because I got lots of what? Yes, exactly, I got lots of time until I got no time left. That's what I hear a lot. Honestly, when I do the consultations, I hear one of two things. Either I have lots and lots of time or, oh my God, my exam, my exam's in two months or in a month or in a week, what do I do? I, and the thing with time, which is interesting, and we, we've come back to this over and over again, that time's really valuable. We, don't we really have more time than everybody else? And in fact, we'll never hear from a CEO that I got you know, more time or less time because time is a great equalizer. We're trying to get into a business school, so we understand that, right? Many people don't, but we do because that's, that's our frame of mind is that you can always have more money, but you can never have more time. And in fact, if you have the time, you can earn the money, but if you have the money, you can't necessarily earn more time. So that is why time is really valuable. And when you're thinking about this whole journey, what I'd like to really encourage you to do is as you're making decision about how to study, and again, the decision is only yours. I can help you make a decision, give you some perspectives, but that's your, your decision. Try to put value on your time. What would it take if you were to study 100 hours versus 400 hours? Or what it, would it take if you do the EMBA in January or March next year versus in March 2023 or 2024? What would that mean to your career? And most importantly, even if we have lots of time, well, we can use this time somewhere else. Maybe we can connect with some friends or maybe if, if we love learning, maybe we could learn something else. Maybe we can upgrade our skills because we all have just 24 hours in a day. But CEOs, they get paid so much more because they know how to use their time efficiently. It's not because they have more time. Make sense? All right, I wanted to show you one final question and then I will do an interview with JD. So here's a question. Another algebra question. Give you 20 seconds to read it.
Okay, let me ask you a quick question. How many times did you read this passage so far? I'm only giving you 30 seconds. Ah, one and a half times, perfect. Most people are saying two times. Somebody's saying four times. Wow, you're a real fast reader. Uh, would you like to see the answer choices? Uh, I think by now you should probably see that there's some habits we're trying to develop. And one of the habits is I need to choose the answer as opposed to solve the problem, right? So how about I show you the answer choices? What do you think? Do the answer choices really help? Or do you think when somebody looks at the answer choices, they might be even more confused? Yeah, most of you are saying more confused. Exactly, because these answer choices have variables. And you remember the algebra question we did before didn't have variables, had some numbers, but now all of a sudden we have all these variables. So, so what do we do? Well, again, let's take a look at a couple of ways of doing this question. Let's go back to the high school. The theory way of doing this question is to remember the distance is equal to rate times time. The question's asking us for the distance, how many miles, and we were given two speeds. There's a speed from home, and then we're going back home at a different speed, at the speed y. We do not know how long it took us to travel with each of the speeds, so we can't really use that formula straight away. But perhaps we could say there's a distance from home and there's a distance back home and the times together at t. And by the way, we were told that it's the same route, so distances are the same. So now we can make them equal. Looks like we have an equation. And that's exactly what the book is suggesting. But I don't know about you. I'm getting really stressed out about this question. And I, when we have a little more time in a live class, sometimes I would give my students like five minutes to do this question. And after five minutes, very few people have an answer because it looks difficult. By the way, this also is ranked as a difficult question. It used to be in the official guide, it's been removed. So is there a better way? Yeah, of course. Here's what we can do. Now, it's important to understand that distance is equal to rate times time. But the formula is just one part of the puzzle. How about I understand this conceptually? How about I say, well, look, if I'm driving, say, from uh, Toronto, where I am right now, to London, Ontario, where JD is now, and it takes me two hours and I'm driving at 100 kilometers an hour, what's the distance? 200, right? I just two times 100. I mean, that makes sense. In fact, never in the world I'm going to do anything else with these two numbers, two and 100. I always multiply them. That's how we always do things. I'm never going to subtract them. I'm never going to just maybe add 100 kilometers an hour plus two hours. The answer is 102. So there you go. The answer is 102. You'll say, wait a second, that doesn't work this way, right? And of course, the GMAT is just like a real world. Whatever we can do in the real world, we all do GMAT. Can you please look at the answer choices and tell me what answer choices try to add speed, which is x or y, to t time? Are there any answer choices that do that? And we know that's not legal. Yeah, you're saying it's b. So b is x plus t. We don't want to add speed to time, so b is out. Any other answer choices? Yeah, Ellie's saying d and e. So D is out and E is out. Two answer choices left. How many of them do we have to test? Just one. Uh, honestly, I want to be lazy. I'm going to test the one that looks a little simpler. A looks like a simple answer choice, so I'm going to test that one. X divided by Y, that gives me a ratio of two speeds. Miles an hour divided by miles an hour. That gives me some sort of a number. And I multiply this by hours. The answer is going to be in hours, right? A gives me hours, but I need miles. So is A the right answer? No, it's not. Well, guess what? How many answer choices are left? Only one, it's C. C has to be the right answer. Nothing else is left. We've eliminated everything else. And that's how we can approach this question. That's working smart. That's saving time. And of course, time is going to be really important on the GMAT. We talked about saving time while we are studying. But of course, because 
you know, time time's important for us. And we have lots of demands on our time, especially now. But time on the GMAT is also going to be critically important because we need to get to the end of the test as quickly as possible and hopefully get the right answer as many times as possible to get to the maximum possible score. Now, many people are asking me, well, okay, well, if I come to your class and if I learn all these strategies, what score will I get? And that's the final thing we'll talk about and then we'll start our interview with JD. And the answer is, now you may have heard you'll get an 800, right? Probably expecting I'm gonna say this. And, 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 and I'm not gonna say this. I'm going to give you a standard MBA answer. And I have my own MBA as well. It depends. Your score will depend on what score do you really need and then how committed you are to getting this score. Because we can give you the best training in the world. And if you have a good coach and you work in efficiency, if you need a good score, you will get this. But honestly, many people who come to our course, they don't need an 800. Sometimes they just need, all they need is 650. Like honestly, sometimes all they need is 600. I can't make you work hard if you just need a 600. Or I cannot make you work harder or smarter if all you need is just 600. But if you need a 700, or if you need a 750, then you might need to do a little bit, something a little bit differently. Sometimes we get people who come to our course and get scores in the 200s and they need scores in the 700s. Is it possible? Yes, absolutely. That's why the average that we get in our course is not really painting the whole picture. But it is still a, quite a telling average that the average, if you're just an average in our course, then you'll already be in the top 20% of everybody in the world. And remember, this is amongst people who actually do the test and only 10% of people do the test. And about a third of our students will get 700 scores of 700 or more. So the first question I get asked is what score will I get? But the second question, how long will it take me? And the answer is again, it depends. We can talk, talk, talk about statistically and I've shared this with you, but if you're like Brian, who comes in with a score in the 500s and all you do is study for the GMAT, you don't, have a, you don't have a job, you don't have any family obligations and you can dedicate six to eight weeks, Brian literally improved his score by 200 points in six weeks. He said, I have two months, but I wanna be on the safe side. I'll take my real test in six weeks. And that's what he did. He got a score of 760. Uh, Fionn, on the contrary, she came and said, look, I am planning to do my MBA in two, three years, but I know I need to study efficiently because I got four jobs and I'm a nurse. I work in the emergency room. So if you can only imagine, I'll be in a life class, she made the time, but after the class, I can do like five hours a week. That's all I can do. And it took her probably about seven months. And then she called me and said, Sergey, I just got a score of 760. What can I do with this amazing score? And that's what I want to hear from you. And that gives me the biggest joy. That's why I do this work. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to really invite you to think about how important is this journey to you? And if you're the sort of person who wants to study smart and maybe make the difference in the world, I mean, we have lots of problems in the world that we need to solve. We need you as a leader in this world. So please don't let the GMAT stand between you and your dream. You can join our live virtual class. Our next class starts this Saturday. Assuming that you've already been studying a little bit, that's a good class to start to join. But if you've forgotten most of the things from school, then before you join our class, we're actually going to give you lots of exercises to work on. Kind of like a warm up. We want you to come to a class ready and they'll be fun. We'll give you lots of essentially high school homework without the boring high school theory, but it's just gonna be the fun high school homework. It's gonna be adaptive. You'll be performing some challenges. You're gonna be earning badges and you're just competing against yourself. You're not competing against other people, but that's how you get ready for the class. So if you haven't been studying yet, then the next evening class on August 24th or the next weekend class at the end of September is a really good option. But if you feel pretty comfortable with the basic mass and if you're the sort of person who just says, look, I love this, I wanna get started right away and I'll do as much work as possible, then join our class this Saturday and we'll still give you the early bird discount if you join the class this Saturday. It's not on our website anymore, but we'll still give it to you. 
Our next verbal refresher class, like I mentioned, is in two weeks. If you haven't ever taken a practice test, uh, here's another link that uh, you could use. By the way, many people are really afraid of taking a practice test because one of the things we've learned from school is we're really afraid of failure. Like, oh my God, what if I get a bad score? But see, I mean, there's no such thing as a bad score. This is just my current score. I need to know how to improve from this course. I'd really like to encourage you to take this practice test and we can chat and I can help you how to at least understand what are the different options to get to the score that you really need. So you'll find all of that at admitmaster.com slash offer. There's samples of our self-study classes. There are discount codes. There is a practice test. There's a link to the consultation. You can find all of that there. And I know some of you are just saying, I just can't wait to get started. So let's chat. So what I'm gonna do while we are transitioning to this interview, and I've already seen the JDs here. Let me uh, make sure that uh, we can see you. Uh, but what I'd like to do while we're doing this, I'm just going to launch a quick poll just for you guys to let me know if that's something you might be interested in. And uh, if it is, then what I'm going to do from my side, I will send you a personal email. I'll share with you all these resources, and then we can chat. And then uh, you get to make a decision of whatever is right for you. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, JD. Uh, it's uh, always- Thanks, Sergey. Nice to be here. Pleasure. So what we're going to do is uh, over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, I have a few questions that we've collected from, uh, um, from some of our clients, from people just like you for JD. Uh, for us to get to know more, well, first of all, about the Ivy West program at Western University, but secondly, most importantly, about what the schools are really looking for when they're evaluating applications. Uh, this is really, these are insider tips. This is like the golden tips. And if you have any questions, please put them in a Q&A box, especially if they're questions we haven't answered yet. And even if you have personal questions, please put them in a Q&A box. At some point, we're going to stop the recording and we can answer your personal questions. And of course, you can also connect with JD and you can connect with myself and we can chat more as well. So let me stop the sharing. You've already got this link. and. Uh, um, maybe I'm going to ask Tatiana, uh, my colleague here, to put in the chat box the link to this offer page. And, uh, and I'm going to close this. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Ivy program and about everything that uh, we need to know about the application. So let me close this. All right. JD, so again, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Yeah, thank uh, you for having me. I have a, a few questions for you. And sure. that is, perhaps we could start with just maybe understanding a little bit more of how, um, just to put things in the perspective. And that is when somebody is, uh, is trying to choose which program to go to, one of the things we usually suggest is trying to understand a little bit more about the class profile. Yeah. who actually studies at these programs, right? Like, what's a typical Ivy MBA student? Can you talk a little bit more about maybe your latest incoming class in terms of where they come from, what their backgrounds are, so that perhaps people here can relate? Yeah, so I'll give a, you know, a broad sense, but then I'm going to answer it in a way that there's not a typical candidate. So uh, in a broad sense, average age is about 28 in our full-time MBA program. Uh, we have two sections. So we uh, intake about 156 students a year. So relatively a small program. Uh, about 50% are born in Canada, 50% outside of Canada, and about 35% of those individuals are coming in under a student visa. So they're immigrating to Canada specifically uh, for the program. Uh, age range is anywhere from uh, 23 to 34. And the average work experience is about five and a half years. So we look for, like many MBA programs, we look for minimum two years of experience and then up to about the 10 year mark. And that's really where the full-time MBA program is designed for individuals, sort of that two to 10 years of experience. Uh, very international in nature. Uh, there's around 25 different citizenships in our, our program, uh, around 30 different languages that are spoken. 
And, and I think the main thing is, and this comes back to the point, Sergey, is I, I really encourage people as they look for an MBA program, and you know this in our conversations is, you know, I, I have an arts degree. I always thought that maybe I wasn't a typical MBA candidate. And so I delayed doing my MBA to the older end of uh, that age range. And really, there's not a typical candidate. And you're going to find that in any school that you look at is that really what we're looking for is tomorrow's leaders. And they come from all different backgrounds in education, all different backgrounds in industries. So the last stat I'll give is there's about 45 different industries in our class. So that just really speaks to the point where people are coming from all different areas. I mean, we've had people come in from, you know, served in the armed forces. We had a wine Somali in our program, somebody that worked at a, uh, you know, resort in charge of the recreation, uh, people that are professional uh, artists, uh, people that are professional sports athletes as well. So again, there's a wide spectrum, but I really encourage people is never ever self-select yourself out of doing an MBA. And that's one of the problems is people look at, you know, profiles and everything else is sometimes you can look at them and say, well, you know, there's not many people like me. Don't fall into that trap. Uh, the diversity is really important in an MBA classroom, really important to the recruiters that recruit students coming out of these programs. And so, uh, you know, don't self-select yourself out. Thank you. And that, that's exactly the comment that we hear a lot uh, from our clients is saying, well, you know, am I a typical MBA candidate? And just like you said, there is no such thing as a typical MBA candidate, right? If yeah. you're a future leader, then absolutely. Uh, if, if you have big dreams, big goals, then absolutely get in touch with the school and start this discussion. And that actually brings us to that um, also point about diversity is uh, I was located in, uh, in beautiful London, Ontario, we are in Canada and many of the people, for example, here on this call are considering coming to Canada and yeah. coming from another country. So how would a school support them? It's a big, big yeah, yeah. challenge, I would say a big task, yes. right? a big step. So, so what, what, could they, what could they rely on? How is the experience like and what the school does to support them? So, you know, when we, we just did a, a webinar a couple of months ago, it's actually on our website where we actually interviewed three students that came uh, to, uh, you know, came from an international student coming uh, to Ivy. And, and one of the things I think that's great about London, Ontario is it's really a college or university town. So, you know, and, and really what happens is everyone that comes here, whether you're a domestic student or international student, you come here to study. And so the cohort becomes very close. There's a community around it. They all live very close to each other. Um, but how we specifically support international students, and we do this in two ways. So individuals that receive an offer, they, they you know, to our program, we automatically connect them with an immigration consultant. And uh, we do that, and, and that's a free service that we provide. And, and so that allows people to understand you know, a little bit more about, you know, what I want, because many students that come internationally want to transition to Canada, live and work here afterwards. That's one of the reasons they're choosing to come to Canada. So the immigration consultant is not only there to help them with the student visa, but also help them to transition to uh, permanent residency and then ultimately uh, citizenship as well. So that's the first area that we do. The other way that we support international students. So once they are confirmed coming into a program, we have somebody uh, that we have contracted with, like our immigration consultant. They're not employees of Ivy. They're actually, you, you know, individuals that we contract with. We provide all of our international student support to get settled in London. And that helps them in, in a couple of ways, and I'll, I'll describe it. One is to find accommodation. So one of the things with international students, you may not be familiar with rent prices, for instance. What is available? What are your needs? And so this is somebody that will actually help you find accommodation and really act on the individual's behalf to make sure that they're, you know, finding something that meets their needs. This individual will also meet them, also provide some support, getting set up with bank accounts, cell phones, uh, you, you know, getting started with groceries and stuff. Uh, they actually meet them when they come into London, take them to their apartment. If individuals are coming in with children or spouses is also making sure that they can get settled, uh, provide city tours and stuff. And, you know, I, I worked overseas myself. And one of the things that is difficult is sometimes you don't know where to go for things. I remember 
Uh, I had a young child at the time and, and we needed to figure out where to go for formula, for instance. So, uh, you know, being able to go to where do you go get groceries, uh, you know, little things like that. How do you set up internet in, in your apartment? And so we have somebody to help support them. Uh, her name is Jody Simpson and uh, she works for a company called City Match. And so she helps support the students. We've been working with her for about five or six years now. So. Wow. Um, uh, and if somebody has any questions about uh, coming in as an international student, could they reach out to your team and, and oh, ask for questions? Oh, for sure. This Definitely. Yeah. Boring in their mind. Yeah. And, and I would also think, you know, one of the things you want to do is, is also, uh, as you look at different MBA programs, is really get to talk to the students as well, right? So I can talk about how we support the students, but the best ones to talk to are the students that actually were supported and, you know, how important that support was for them. And speaking actually about choosing the school, there's, um, as, as of course, uh, you always tell all of the prospective students, and we do the same, is that choosing the school is really a two-way street. Is yeah. first, usually you choose the school and then you need to make sure that the school chooses you as well. So maybe let's talk about the choice of a school because it is a really important yeah, decision. Uh, so, so let's talk from a couple of perspectives. Uh, one is why would, what would be some of the main reasons? Maybe you could give us like maybe three reasons. Why would somebody consider going to Ivy? Yeah, I, I think the main thing, so we have a one-year program. So individuals, uh, you know, that allows individuals not to be out of the workforce that long. So I would say that is sort of, uh, you know, a practical reason where somebody might look at it. Um, I think the other reason that people choose is the way that we do education with the case study approach. So very similar to Harvard. There's only four true case schools. There's Harvard, Darden, IMD in Lausanne, Switzerland, uh, and, and then ourselves that use that. So that is also a main reason why people choose the school is the education experience we deliver. And one of the things we're proud of is we've been ranked by The Economist uh, for four years in a row, top 10 globally. And this is based out of survey data of alumni on, uh, so we've been ranked in the top 10 globally out of hundred schools on the education experience we deliver. And uh, that's an important element of it. Our, our uh, alumni network, but also our network with recruiters. And uh, you know, students coming into our program do very well as far as placement rates, um, do very well with, uh, you know, not only the placement rates, but also very happy that the program met their goals. So, you know, give another ranking result by The Economist. The reason I like The Economist is it's based on survey data of individuals that went through the program. So for five years in a row, we've been ranked in the top 20. This past year, number 11, the worst we've ever done is number 16 out of 100 schools on how uh, alumni have rated us by the career services that they received in the program. But you know, the biggest piece of advice I have to individuals, and MBA is an MBA, you're not gonna find much difference in the curriculum. I can actually give two pieces of advice in choosing a program. You're gonna find much difference in the curriculum because an MBA is an MBA program. But really, you wanna get to know the culture of the school. And the best way to do that is reach out to recruitment advisors. You'll get a sense of the culture of the school and dealing with them. Talk to alumni, talk to current students, participate in events, and really think about, is this a place that I think I can belong outside of the academics? Because that's really important. You know, it's the same thing. You could do a job and, and you could do the same job in one organization to the other. But really, when you look at, you know, looking in work, aspect, that culture can be very different across different organizations. And you want to make sure that the culture really fits. The second thing is, and Sergey, this goes back to how you started this question is, it is a big decision for people. But big decisions are also very overwhelming decisions as well. And sometimes it's human nature, when we get overwhelmed by decisions, we take the easiest route not the best route for us. And so I'd really encourage people to kind of, as you get through this, you're gonna get overwhelmed in making this decision. I mean, it is a huge decision. And back to your point, international students, you gotta leave your family, you gotta move here, move to a brand new country. Um, but also, you know, always kind of keep in your back of your mind and that sort of check with yourself, am I making the right decision 
or am I taking the easy decision? And I think that's uh, really important to kind of keep in mind as you, you look at different programs and, and make this decision. Thank you, JD. Can we uh, dig just a little bit deeper into choosing the program? Sure. Specifically in terms of Ivy, what would you say, or what would the students say are the best parts of the program? What are the highlights? Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a good. I, I think there's the education that they got and the case study. So what happens in the classroom? And then the second thing is what happens outside the classroom, the community that the students have. And, you know, how close they become with their classmates and how, you know, the friendships that they develop. And, you know, again, it's, you know, what happens in, and, and really, you know, the impact that it made on them. And, and, you know, that leads to an impact, not only an impact that they have professionally, but an, in, you know, an impact that it has on them uh, personally as well. And, and those are always when, you know, we, we survey the students or, you know, and I keep in touch with a lot and you talk to them and you, you, uh, you know, as we have events, we always ask, you know, what's the reason you chose Ivy and what was the best part of the program? And, uh, you know, when people talk about the best parts of the program, it was like, you know what, the case study was fantastic. I really loved that environment. It was a great way for me to learn. I found that when I got back into the professional setting, my skill set was just really, really enhanced. And, you know, but it's also about the friendships that people develop and the culture that individuals have outside the program. And, and one of the things that, you know, I always loved seeing is, is you love seeing the activities that people are doing outside of the classroom and how close they are. And again, I think a function of that is that the fact they're moving to a university town and everyone, you know, people aren't from, you know, we have maybe two or three out of that 156 that are from London, but many individuals are coming from all over Canada, all over the world, and they're coming here. They all come here to study. And so their focus is on their classmates for that year that they're here. They're not distracted by other things going on or family commitments or commitments with other friends. They really are in this sort of, um, you know, aspect of it. You know, I was talking to somebody about it and, and Sergey, you know, in, in the conversations we've had, I'm a big person in analogies, right? And, and it's like when somebody wants to learn a language, right? So how do you learn a language? You can get books, you know, like Rosetta Stone to learn a language. But the other thing is immerse yourself in experience to learn about the language. And, you know, when you come to London, you're immersing yourself in the student experience, not only in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom as well. Uh, exactly, and I remember when uh, we've done a lot of these seminars, one of the things that I remember a lot from uh, what you were saying is that sometimes when we look at uh, what other people are suggesting, or when we look at what the rankings are saying, sometimes the rankings based on the things that might not necessarily be the most important for us. So somebody is saying, this is the most amazing program. I'd like to really encourage you to dig a little bit deeper into why. And is that the thing that's most important to you? And choose the program based on what's most important to you. Exactly. I think that's great advice. And, and that is, you know, when we talk to people about that decision, we always say, you know, start with this question of what matters most to you. And think about it in a couple of ways. What matters most to you about the education experience you want, the culture that you want to join in the program, and also what career you're looking for afterwards, and making sure that programs fit with what matters most to you. And, and you never go wrong when you start evaluating programs on what matters most to you. Exactly, that's a great advice. Now, speaking about the career. Yeah. Uh, um, I, the Ivy MBA program is one year. Yes. And it's... Uh, you know, many people mistakenly think that a one-year program is half of the two-year programs. It's actually not. No. Right? The two-year the two programs yeah. are typically 16 months in class and the one-year program is 12 months in class. Well, what would you say, how would somebody make this decision? Because that's one of the, I'm sure, sure. that's on, on, on a lot of people's minds and we actually got quite a few people saying, well, can you please make sure that we talk about this? Yeah. So what would you say? How could somebody choose? Yeah, so, so I'll talk about maybe, I'll go back in history about why we did a one-year program. So, um, you know, a big, when we do anything with our program, whether it's curriculum, uh, you know, or any changes of the program, 
a big, big stakeholder that we talk to, in fact, the main stakeholder is recruiters, so our corporate partners that hire our students. Because at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that, uh, you know, students coming into the program meet recruiter expectations. You wanna make sure the program does, because if students get out, get the career choices that they want and get the, you know, opportunities that are provided, they're gonna be happy alumni, you have happy recruiters. And so um, we went to a one-year program in 2005. So it has been 16 years since we did. And when we went to a one-year program, we actually cut our class size in half. We used to have four sections and around 300 and some students. And we actually cut it in half. And, and that realization that, you know, it really depends on the experience you're coming into is that a one-year program versus a two-year program, a one-year program fits individuals and a two-year program might fit individuals better. So there are some myths about a one-year program. And, and I'll talk about the data. The myths are you can't change career paths. So, you know, any given year, I, I think this past year is about 94% of individuals did a career change. Um, you know, so it's always around that 92 to 95% mark and it's been consistently there. So our placement rates are as high or higher than two-year programs. Our career change is as high or higher than two-year programs. But what we do on our side is we want to make sure one year program fits with your career, uh, you know, aspirations. And so our interviews, so I would say this, maybe I'll set it up this way, Sergey, is don't self select yourself out by saying, oh, I don't think a one year program is going to be a fit with me. You know, actually, let us help you with that decision. And here's how we help you with that decision. Our admissions interviews are done by our career coaches. They're not done by admission staff which most universities do. They are done by our career coaches. And the reason is we want to get to, we want to dig deeper into your career goals than what's based on the, the resume. We wanna to get to know the experience you're coming into. And we wanna make sure that that meets recruiter expectations. We want to make sure coming into the program that a one-year program is a fit with you, that you don't need an internship on where you're going. So there are times that we deny candidates, they will do great in the classroom. There is no concern about their classroom, but we wanna make the decision about what's best for the candidate. And so we'll share with the candidate that you are better off in a two-year program because that internship is gonna help you. And so really what it comes down to is, it really comes down to sort of that depth of experience that individuals are coming into, and we help you determine that, so. So does that help answer the, the question around it? Yeah, so, it helps a lot. And yeah. you're actually starting to touch upon how you make decisions about what candidate will be accepted in a program. And of course, programs such as IV is very competitive, especially that you've cut it down in half. So um, what what are you looking for? I, I know, of course, yeah. there's the academic credentials, there's the GMAT, uh, that's important. But how do you assess that fit and the personality yeah. and that demand? You started touching upon yeah, yeah. that. I, I think there's a couple of things and I'll, I'll leave the academic side because sometimes that's obvious, right? But, I, but I'll give a sense of, you know, um, because the most question we get, I'll touch on it a little bit on two aspects of it. One is we get a lot of questions about people that say, well, what's your minimum GPA? We don't have a minimum GPA. We have an average GPA. And sometimes there are situations where individuals might have a lower GPA but they can compensate for that by having a strong GMAT. So that's the first thing I will say is that don't self-select yourself out because you have a horrible GPA. We have a great thing called a GMAT. So person, and you know this, Sergey, about me, I had a horrendous GPA, but I wrote a good GMAT. I had a 680 GMAT. So that kind of negated the horrendous uh, GPA uh, that I had. The um, second thing is, okay, what's the GMAT score? And there is a wide range, a range of, you know, our average GMAT scores around 665 and our range of GMAT scores is anywhere from, you know, 520 to 760, 780. So again, there's a wide range uh, in there, but I'll talk more about, you know, how we assess fit on experience level. And, and I think there's two aspects of it. One is you want to make sure in any, any MBA program that you're applying to, is to really highlight your experience and your, your impact and accomplishments that we had. So one of the things we talk a lot about is trying to get a sense of 
you know, outside of your job description, what are those accomplishments and impact that, that you, you know, has been important to you? Things like, where did you show initiative? Where did you get things done? Where did you lead a project? You know, working amongst in teams. And the other thing is we want to get to know the values of the individual. That's really important. So are they going to be a good team player in the program? Are they going to support their classmates? Because um, we want to make sure that we have an environment where, you know, that aligns with our values. And what's important about our values is it's a very supportive environment. And not only supportive in, in the staff and the faculty that the students, but also making sure that the students are supported to one another. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a really important aspect. So getting to know the person on who they are, what their values are, and also getting to know the level of experience, particularly around the impact and accomplishments that the individual has. And uh, you showcase that not only your resume, uh, your references, you can showcase that, but ultimately the important part to showcase that is in the interview, so. You actually touched upon the resume, which is uh, a very important part of the application, of course. And I remember you talked a lot about now in, yeah. in our seminars about uh, really having more of an accomplishment-based resume. So when, when you see the resume, what's the first thing you're looking for? And, uh, and perhaps you can talk about also what are some of the great things to have on the resume and what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing in the resume and maybe in overall applications that you're saying, wow, that's a yeah. red flag. So, so I'll talk about what we look for. I mean, uh, automatically you, you look at the, you know, the first thing you look at is that the person has shown some progression in their career and have some level of responsibility. So they've been, you know, and I think what you want to do is you also want to make sure, and this is good resume tips, even for applying for jobs, right? You want to make sure that your resume is very accomplish oriented. So thinking about those things that you're most proud of. I remember going for an interview once and I remember it was a panel interview. And uh, the person who was the hiring manager said at the end and said, you know, think about that time in your career that you were at the highest, right? Like you, you know, couldn't be, you were the proudest you ever were in your career. And so I answered that. And then the second one, the second question, he said, okay, I got one more. When were those times you struggled and how did you get through it? And I think uh, what you want to do is you want to talk about your accomplishments, sometimes accomplishments of where you had to work through something that was a very difficult period. And um, don't be afraid to even bring your personality out in your resume. I think it's always important to share about what interests that you have outside. So every school is going to be different. Some schools do letter of intent, some do resumes, some have a template on the resumes. What we do here at Ivy is we say, we don't have a template take as much space as you need, right? You're not gonna be penalized if you have a short one, you're not gonna be penalized if you have a long one, but allows you that element to be creative uh, around it. So I think that's what you kind of wanna make sure is that it's accomplish oriented, but also bring your personality in it. I think the biggest mistake I see when people make is that they aren't their authentic self. And you know they, they start writing the resume or even the admissions interview or the essays, what they think the school wants to hear. And, the, and I'll tell you where that mistake happens. When you get to the interview, what the interviewer is gonna do is they're gonna look at your resume, they're gonna look at your interviews and they're gonna ask you questions around it. If, you know, so, so let me give an example. Let's say you were involved in a really cool project at work but you weren't heavily involved in it. Maybe you were brought in in a couple of meetings. So, you know, you weren't really heavily involved in it. And, um, and then when it comes to the interview and the interviewer is starting to ask you questions about that involvement that you had, if it wasn't a deep experience for you, your story is going to start to collapse, right? Because they're going to ask you, well, tell me more about that oh, well, tell me more about this. And if it's not a deep experience for you, then the story is going to collapse. You're not going to do well uh, in the interview. So, you know, you're not doing anybody any favors by saying, I think this is what the school wants to hear. So that's the, that's the first mistake that I'm going to say. Be your authentic self. I'm going to give some other mistakes that people make. I, I think the second mistake that people make is that they, they don't, 
reach out to the school and build those relationships with the admission staff, the current students and the alumni. And, and you know, you want to make sure that they get to know you through the process. And I think that's a really important thing because you know, we're here to help you put together a strong application. And you know, we're, we're here to help guide you through the process. And, and you know, so I'd encourage people to reach out to any school that they are considering. And so we'll get applications in and we'll say, no one's ever talked to this person before and gotten to know them. And uh, what the admission staff and the recruitment staff are able to do is if they get to know you is they're able to you know, um, provide more information about your candidacy as well outside of just on the application form. But more importantly, we're here to help you put together a strong application. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for, for sharing these tips. I always love hearing your tips and I'm sure that everybody who's here for the first time appreciates them as well. Uh, and you, you talked about accomplishments and you also talked about the school looking for future leaders. So how do you actually look for that leadership? What, what sort of advice would you give to people who are putting together an application of how exactly can they demonstrate their leadership capabilities and their leadership experience, mm -hmm. especially maybe if somebody hasn't really had a lot of you know, formal leadership experience, what would you suggest? And, and most of the candidates don't have formal leadership experience in our full-time MBA program. And, and I'm gonna talk about it in a couple of ways and then give some examples. And, and I'll give the examples because I think it's important that sometimes people think outside uh, the box on it. But think about in your professional career where you had to make initiatives, where you gave suggestions, where maybe you had to sell an idea, um, you know, had to work in a team and get through things through done through others, maybe where you had ability to get things done. These are just some examples uh, around it. Um, where you had to maybe figure things out yourself and, and work uh, without little direction. But I'm going to give you three examples uh, that come to mind about where people demonstrated some great leadership that might allow you to think outside the box. One, I remember sitting in an admissions interview and the individual, in fact, I, I talked to the individual beforehand and he said, do you think it's okay that I share this? I said, I think it's fantastic because it shows leadership. The person took what they thought was their dream job. They get into the job and it's not their dream job. And so they talked about their realization about what that happened. And the person actually quit this job, a very secure job, and you know, to make ends meet, ended up bartending until they found the next one. But they talked about what they learned from that experience about themselves and how they kind of adapted uh, through it and, and got through it. The second example I'll share with you is we had a reference come in once from an individual that uh, this individual, she coached a young girl's soccer team. And the reference was actually from a parent talking about the impact that this individual had on the kids on the soccer team and particularly this person's daughter and talked about, you know, his observation of her leadership abilities. So again, that's something outside of what you would do at work. Uh, that, you know, sometimes it comes down to problem solving. So I'll give another example that somebody talked about in one of their essays and then ultimately one of their interviews. Uh, they were doing um, a volunteer thing and uh, they, they, you know, with children. So it was a volunteer thing that they did overseas in another country. These, uh, you know, this individual spoke English. The, in the kids that they were working with did not speak English. So she's trying to think about, you know, how do I get these children's attention, right? To, to kind of gather and play sports and everything else. So she learned juggling. And so when she started juggling, of course, the kids would come over and, and watch her. And that's how she got the children to congregate. So thinking about those situations on, you know, and sometimes that involves thinking and it involves creativity as well. So, you know, if I think back to my career, there's, it's easy to talk about the leadership stuff at work. It's, it's thinking outside of uh, at what you've done outside of work. Uh, to test your leadership capabilities. I will tell you the biggest test of my leadership capabilities are my two daughters. I have lots of examples to share around that, so. That's amazing. See, sometimes, and sometimes uh, perhaps 
for you, the reference could be actually your daughter, right? And yeah. it's thinking this outside the box and thinking about um, how do you actually create an application? That's why when we speak with candidates, we're saying the application isn't a copy paste. Uh, it, it's not just something that you just fill in the blanks. It's, it's really, you have to think about how do you showcase yourself? Because that's exactly what you're going to do when you are applying for a job. That perhaps what you're going to do if you're pitching your idea to, uh, to venture capitalists or angel investors, right? You're going to sell yourself. You're going to pitch yeah. yourself. And, and this is the chance of you to actually pitch yourself to the school. And, and the outcome could be, of course, I'm getting into the school of my dreams. But another outcome could be I might get an entrance scholarship as a result. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the entrance scholarship. That's the question we get asked a lot. Who gets an entrance scholarships? How many people get entrance scholarships? Sure. Or, Entrance scholarship? Do they usually get? Can you talk a little bit about? Yeah. This? So, so our, that? you know, about 80, 75 to eighty percent of the class will get an entrance scholarship. The range of award is anything from you know ten thousand Canadian to seventy thousand Canadian. So we don't have full scholarships. Uh, so the the highest is around the seventy thousand mark. The average comes in about thirty thousand. But it's based holistically on your application. I mean, the highest scholarship that we gave last year was somebody with a 670 GMAT. And so, you know, there are, I, I will tell you the components that go into it. You know, the GMAT is a consideration. Um, you know, what th they've done at work, the strength of their references, their interview counts for a lot as well. You know, what they are as an individual and, and bring it into the program. And so we look at it holistically. We decide on the scholarship the same time we decide on admissions. So there's not a separate admissions, you know, a separate scholarship committee or, or anything like that that determines it. So individuals know when they get an admissions offer, offer uh, what the amount of their scholarship is. So I, I think that is probably, it's, it's holistic. It, it, there's no correlation to if you do better this way, it's, it's on the overall strength of your file. Uh, but I would say the interview uh, has a, a you know, a, a weighting in it is almost equal as what the GMAT is. And uh, so I think that's always an important thing for individuals to take seriously, not only for admissions, but also for the scholarship as well. But it shouldn't be something people are worried about and intimidated about, because I will leave this thought because, you know, I was talking to somebody today and they said, look, I'm really worried about the interview. And I said, look, you know your experience better than anybody else. That's the mindset you've got to go in. And, you know, that's my daughter's interviewing for a summer job right now. And she's got a second interview uh, tomorrow. And she said, you got any advice? I said, you know your experience better than anybody else. And that's the mindset you have to go in with. So. And that's a great advice. And of course, building that confidence and uh, knowing what, uh, what you have to offer is really, really important. Right? We talked about yeah. the building confidence on the GMAT and the same as building confidence when you're going to be the interview, the same as again, building confidence when you're pitching your idea, your project, even if you're not looking for a new job, you're going to go to your boss and pitch that new project. And, and that's really, really important. Uh, and, and, and you know, the interview is not designed to be tricks, right? There's hmm. no technical aspects in it. We do provide people, you know, some, we have podcasts and, and uh, you know, to provide individuals coaching before they go into the interview and what they can expect. Right. So we don't give the answers out, but we do give advice on here, here's what you can expect going into the interview and the stuff that you want to prepare. Part of interviewing, Sergey, goes back to your thing about selling yourself. It doesn't matter whether you're interviewing for an MBA program or for a job. It really comes down to storytelling. And so what you want to do is it, 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 it really comes down to your stories, which is your own experience. So. Exactly, and uh, and speaking about um, speaking about selling yourself and speaking about taking things seriously, um, we've learned today that uh, about seven million people a year consider going to a business school, but only about two hundred thousand yeah. people actually do the GMAT. So, people who are here on this call, these are the people who take things seriously. So, I really want to thank you and right. congratulate you on staying here and and to listening to all these great advice. And perhaps just gonna ask you for one final advice. And if anybody sure. has any questions, uh, please put them in the Q and A box, and I'll share with you contact JD's contact information. Uh, and uh, JD, perhaps you can put your contact information as well, but we'll yeah. share it with you by email tomorrow as well. 
But maybe if you were to give the final advice for people who are who are here tonight and they're very serious about applying to an Ivy MBA, what would, what advice would you give them? What kind of final? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Just do it. I I think you know I'm going to go back to that stat of you know, what is that, you know, you'll test my math here. So how many people apply? And then what is it like 2% of people go through it? Is that about right? Like maybe even yeah, something like this. Exactly. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, and I, I think what happens is people get scared of the GMAT, they get scared of applying. It is a leap of faith, right? That um, you are uh, quitting a job, we are going back to school without a, a clear outcome. An MBA is not about that first job after graduation. The real payoff as an MBA is as you go forward in your career. And, you know, it's about making sure doors open, but also making equally as sure that doors don't close. And Sergey, we talk about this all the, you know, what I love about my job is, and, and I truly am very, you know, is to get to see the difference that this program makes for individuals, both personally and professionally. And, you know, we just finished Canada Day was July 1st. So, you know, it's five weeks away and seeing the international students on, you know, on Facebook and, and Instagram posting photos of them, you know, some of them are getting citizenship, um, you know, celebrating Canada, celebrating being in a new country, seeing people that, you know, start a family here, buy their first homes. And it is incredibly inspiring. And I always say that, you know, what I love about my job is I'm in the dream business. And, and I can tell you that and I forget that quote that I share. It's something about you're only one decision away from a totally different life. Mm -hmm. And I think the decision to do an MBA program is really about investing in you, not only as a professional, but you personally. And it is truly a transformational experience. So my advice is anybody that's on this call today is seriously considering doing an MBA program. Just do it. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to sell, I, you know, I'm proud of Ivy, but wherever you go and do an MBA program, you're not going to be wrong in the way that it's going to make a difference. Where you go wrong is maybe choosing a program that's not a good fit for you, but, you know, choosing a program where it's a good fit, where you're going to get a lot of value out of it, you're never, ever going to go wrong. So. And I love your advice that you've shared earlier today is um, think about whether you're making the right decision or the easy decision. And sometimes, uh, sometimes this is not an easy decision to make, but make it for the right reasons. Yeah. And um, I can speak from my own experience as well. It is a long-term investment. And you, I'm looking at uh, some of the experiences of the people I did the MBA program with, including myself. Some of the things we were able to do, and many of us have switched our careers several times while we were out of school already for, I've done my MBA, 17 years now, uh, 17 years ago, some of us have had multiple careers already. And we, we've been able to do this because the MBA gave us the right skill. So it is really yeah. a, a long-term investment. It's not just financial. I've shared some of the statistics with everyone as well, that the average return investment is $3 million up. And uh, usually more of it is after about years five or 10, because you might have a small jump into that first job. But just like you said, JD, it's not really about that first job, but it's much more about that personal satisfaction. It's about doing something you're really passionate about. It's about making the difference in the world. Many MBAs, I'm, uh, as, as I'm following some of my colleagues as well, some of them worked in the corporate world and now they work for not-for-profit. Uh, one, uh, one of my colleagues, one of my dear friends, he now works for an, an organization that actually works on reducing plastic waste around the world and get a very a successful corporate career before that. So the sky is the limit. And just like you said, when you do an MBA, you make sure that the doors don't close. And I've also heard the phrase that the MBA eliminates the glass ceiling, but builds the glass, builds the floor. So at some point, you're just going to say, I'm going to play on a totally different level. I'm going to share a personal story just on this whole aspect of making a decision for the right reasons, not, you know, sometimes the easiest region. So uh, you know, my first job out of university is I worked for Queen's University or Smith School of Business. And uh, um, I worked there for about 10 years and, and my wife was from Kingston and, you know, where it was. And we had never really had the opportunity to travel. And I got a job offer to go over and work for a school in Slovenia. 
And I remember uh, a mentor at the time, uh, he said, what have you decided to do? I said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to accept it. And he said, why? And I said, you know, I just bought a brand new car. The car was probably like five months old. And I said, you know, I got to move overseas and I got to get rid of this car and I'm going to lose money on it. And he said, well, how much do you think you're going to lose? I said, probably about $5,000, right? He said, a year from now, you won't even remember that $5,000. And he was wrong about one thing. I didn't remember those $5,000 three months from that time. You know, because what happened was it was like such a great experience. And, you know, I always remember that story of him saying, you know, you'll never, ever, you know, you're going to forget about that $5,000 a year from now. I forgot it, you know, two months into the experience because it was a great time. I learned a lot. I love the role. But more importantly, I learned a lot about myself as a person, had a great experience as well. So that shares that, you know, sometimes we can get caught up in those, sometimes those practical things, right? And again, I was overwhelmed by the decision. You know, I had to sell a house, I had to leave a job, uh, you know, go overseas for a couple of years in a foreign, you know, foreign country that I didn't know much about, but it was the best thing that I ever did. So second to my MBA, I would say the MBA ranks first. That was a close second though. Oh, that's amazing. And, and I, I also remember a quote that most people, uh, when, they, when they get to their golden ages, regret things that they have not done. And most yeah. people don't regret things they have done. I agree. That's a great, I, I think that's very, very true. So, yeah. Well, thanks so much, JD. To thanks, Sergey. It was always a pleasure. With us. So, and thanks for answering these questions. We don't have any questions in the QA. Uh, that, that means that we've, we've covered most of the things that was in everybody's mind. So, Thanks again for, uh, to everyone for joining us. We will be sharing the recording of this interview and, um, and have, a, have an awesome time. Uh, enjoy your summer and we look forward to seeing you, most of you in our classes and um, please connect with JD as well. Start the discussion and please remember JD and his team are there to help you make the right decisions as Definitely. well. Definitely. Yeah, thanks Sergey and thanks everyone uh, for joining it. So it's great. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.